Hello again and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. This is James Tanner and we are going to have a webinar today on basic paper document preservation. I might mention that this particular webinar was broadcast some time ago but because of some technical issues it needed to be re-recorded so those of you who may have listened to the presentation earlier will find that there will be some differences obviously between what I say today and what is going to go it what went into the webinar a few weeks ago first of all I guess I should mention that this particular slide here the first beginning slide shows a document preservation camera set up in uh, the Maryland State Archives where my wife and I were serving as document preservation specialists for family search and digitizing records from the Maryland State Archives. The camera uh, is barely visible in this particular photo. It's a little black box right at the top of the slide. So if you uh, this is a formal kind of arrangement um, and each of these uh, setups are actually um, custom made so that they can adjust to the uh, the size of the area and the light conditions and everything else that's necessary and we use two monitors one to monitor the the scans and the other to uh, record and uh, keep track of the information the documents after scanning are are loaded onto in digital format are loaded onto hard drives and shipped to Salt Lake City where they are processed and put up onto family search and a copy of which is given to the archives for their use like that technical today I'd like to start out by making kind of an observation here that many genealogists are stuck in a time warp uh, they live in a world of paper, they live in a world of uh, family group records and uh, research logs and all sorts of information and huge piles of paper and files and folders and organizations and documents and all sorts of things. And that time warp gives them the impression or the problems of determining whether or not there's uh, some sort of duplication when you start talking about digitally, digitally preserving records. In this particular uh, presentation I'm talking primarily about not just digitally re, uh, preserving the records but also physically producing, preserving paper records. And the time involved in the comparison uh, is uh, part of the consideration here. This is not a paper versus electronics proposition. It is a situation where the paper is important and it needs to be preserved and the form of putting it in electronics is simply another way of backing up or preserving. So let me kind of imagine put this into a, a context. Let's suppose that you were had been doing genealogical research for some time. You had a number of records that you had accumulated. Uh, many of these records were originals that were attained from uh, repositories such as archives and, and record, uh, record sources departments from various countries or, or states. And the question then is how do I preserve this document? Well, uh, there's a, an important point here is that if I preserve the one piece of paper that has the information that's just that record. If I reproduce it and also if I digitize it and I also uh, add it to a collection of my digital records then uh, I can share those records globally across the world with anyone who might be interested in my uh, in, in my research efforts and I can collaborate and sh and help people with uh, understanding the, the information that I've acquired whereas on a paper record absent 
spending money and, and expenses for a copy machine. You're simply going to get a photocopy of a, a record, which may or may not last as long as the original record. Comes up as to why not digitize everything and forget the paper? Why in the world would we want to uh, keep the paper around if we already had a digital copy? Well, then we're going to need to take a step back and look at exactly what is happening. First of all, the paper themselves, uh, the papers themselves are artifacts. They are original documents. They're originals that contain information that was entered perhaps by an ancestor or by someone else who uh, had some contact with the ancestor. So it's not or situation. It's not a situation where we're saying we want you to keep the paper and you don't have to worry about digitizing, but we want to have a digitized record of the document to preserve the paper, which we'll talk about what happens to paper, and then we'll also uh, have the electronic copy. Oh yes, but electronic copy could disappear and it might get lost and it might... Well, there's ways to preserve the paper copies. There's a separate set of, of criteria that will help us to preserve the uh, electronic copies. Uh, digital preservation is a completely dis different subject. There's a whole different level of concern and ways that, that uh, the digital records <coughs> are preserved and uh, that is not the same as trying to preserve a piece of paper. So the answer here, it's not an either and or situation, it's both. We want to make sure that we preserve our paper originals because they may be artifacts and have per se in, in, their, in, their, in their existence as a paper document historical significance. So this is a very important thing to uh, a decision that has to be made. And the reason why I originally started out by saying that many geneal genealogists were caught, caught in a time warp is because uh, they may be spending a lot of time organizing and, and uh, preserving, in a sense, uh, their paper records. But without the digital component, they're losing the that another method of backing up the information which preserves all the information. There's kind of two considerations going here. One is the preservation of a significant or historical document, something that may be unique and tied to an ancestor, a letter, uh, some kind of certificate, something that may not be uh, available today or, or is uh, uh, was was unique at the time that it was created. And so that's one kind of preservation and the other kind of preservation is uh, backing up the information so that the information is not lost when, when and if the document were lost. Now <clears throat> let's think of it as a, an information storage medium. That is those papers, this back here in the background here, we have some folded documents that uh, where we were processing at the uh, Maryland State Archives when we were back there working as preservation specialists. And in that particular situation, those documents had been folded up and put in those, well not those containers, but had put in some container uh, up to 200 plus years in the past. And since that time, no one had been able to touch or uh, exam no one had to touched or examined the documents. The fact that they were there um, may have been known. Uh, there was a large paper catalog at the at the archives, uh, card catalog that listed a lot of the documents, but not ne not necessarily all of them, and certainly not all of the information that was contained in all of these documents. So. Uh, when we think of paper as an information storage medium, we find out that it's it's uh, maybe uh, f depending on the quality of the paper, as I'll discuss in the f in just a few minutes, uh, it could be something that preserves the information for a considerable period of t period of time. But on the other hand, it may uh, it, it is only available at one place at one time 
And there is really, without an exceptionally large amount of, uh, of external information being added and recorded about the document, any way to tell exactly who or what is mentioned in the document. Okay, for example, these were probate documents. Obviously, you would index or, or know about who the probate was by the name of the deceased. As a matter of fact, uh, the probate records usually generated the name of the deceased. The problem there is that there were lots of other people mentioned in the records. In some cases, for example, in the accountings or the sale of the probate estate, when the property of the deceased was sold, there were dozens, if not hundreds, of names of people who participated in the sale. These are valuable records, but they're never, they're, without being digitized, they were totally unavailable to anyone who did not come to the archives, request the documents, and then um, go through individually and search the documents. So it, converting a document to an electronic media is essentially a valu very valuable way to um, uh, pr help preserve not just the medium, but also the document, the information in the document itself. Um, before we get too far into this, um, I'd like to make sure that you understand that the principles that we're going that I'm going to go through here in this particular presentation are uh, reflected in the Preservation Directorate, which is part of the Library of Congress. You can find this on the Library of Congress website, which is uh, loc.gov forward slash preservation. And particularly a lot. So why are we concerned with paper? Why don't we just extract all the information and throw it away? Well, uh, there are some records that are kept by genealogists that have little or no value. For example, uh, if you uh, have a family group record which reflects simply the names and dates and uh, vital information about the members of the family, and it has no particular sources listed on it or references to it, that piece of paper is uh, probably have little value in a, in, from an, an artifact standpoint. It's probably something that once it, the information is entered into an online database or into your genealogy program, that piece of paper has been supplanted entirely by the, um, by the record that you've created on the electronic media. So, uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is, there is a significant possibility that, this, that these uh, artifacts are hist of historical value as such. And I guess one of the most common ones of those that you would find would be books. Uh, books are obviously, um, uh, have intrinsic value to some people and a lot of people uh, collect books, but uh, particularly among genealogists, it's very possible that there are family books that have been written and surname books about your family name or your family's uh, ancestral, dis the descendants of an ancestor, that are uh, almost unique. Uh, they may be very, very small run print printings of, of the information that was uh, compiled about your family. Uh, there may be only a few uh, very small number of uh, of copies of the of volumes available. So once you have a copy of this, you certainly want to preserve it, and it may entail giving that to a library or an archive that uh, will can further preserve it. And in some instances, of course, you'll have the book digitized and able to be available to others. Another thing we're going to accomplish, uh, we uh, get a lot of, is just individual sheets of paper uh, from research, uh, maybe uh, images that we copied off of records. Uh, I ended up uh, early on in my uh, years of uh, doing research with uh, tens of thousands of pages of copies, uh, photocopies that I had made of, of uh, family group records, of other information that I was extracting from the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, all of that was transcribed into uh, uh, electronic media, into, into different programs, and eventually has ended up in the Family Search Family Tree 
uh, program online and, uh, and many other programs, including My Heritage and Ancestry and other programs where I've put the information electronically. But all of those copies I made were not originals. They were not uh, documents that were going to be preserved. Uh, they were simply pieces of paper that had a copy of something that I uh, then transformed into another type of media. And so most of that I have not kept. I have not uh, gone through. But I have had to go through it individually by page to determine that there weren't other things, which I found quite frequently was were interleafed among the copies that I had made. So that's one reason we're concerned with paper. We may need to preserve it for some period of time. Now, as I've been mentioning pre just a minute ago, the, the uh, one thing that's important is that you have certificates of achievement, other things, I mean all sorts of certificates, baptismal, uh, marriage certificates, all sorts of things. And these documents have intrinsic historic and the uh, and family connections that are uh, very important and pr and should be preserved, and then you have all sorts of other things, including photographs, which are primarily printed on paper and and uh, for most of the history of photography, and there are other other types of of preservation issues, of course, for earlier photographs that were on metal sheets or glass or whatever. So the reality is that a genealogist world is um, filled with paper. It's just uh, massive, usually massive amounts of paper that we're dealing with. I have had, uh, I guess, the privilege, I, it would be a privilege for me, to uh, uh, look at people's collections and, and help them to decide what they wanted to preserve and what they did not want to preserve. And uh, I have been in, in homes where an entire room, a fairly good sized room, from floor to ceiling and all around the, in the middle of the floor, was filled with file cabinets, shelves, and, and uh, thousands and thousands of pages of paper. Whereas uh, in some other cases, it's managed to all get fit into one uh, pasteboard, cardboard box, if you will, of, of documents or whatever. So. These different collections have uh, different values, but uh, that's kind of where we still are, regardless of, of our amount of digitized records and regardless of the care that we're taking for what we do have. It seems like the paper and the documents seem to accumulate. And another part that's important to understand is we have a long way to go before all the paper in the world is digitized. Um, it's not hard to understand that this is an important thing when you get to the point of finding out that um, you have uh, you've gone into an archive like uh, the National Archives in Washington D.C. and find out how little of the the number of documents that there are in existence have actually been made available electronically and digitized. So for these reasons, it's very important that we continue our process of digitization, but that we preserve the paper documents that we have until they digitized. Okay, now we can answer, ask some questions about what is paper. Um, here's a simple explanation. It's a thin material produced by pressing together moist fibers of cellulose pulp derived from wood, rags, or grasses, and drying them into flexible sheets. Okay, so the process of paper making, it's, it's interesting. Um, I went through my paper making stage uh, a few years back and we uh, chopped up uh, c cotton and we tried to cop chop up a few other things and uh, turn it into paper. It was uh, an interesting process. It's certainly not uh, something that would be productive for uh, other than artistic or or aesthetic reasons. It's, it's a, a little bit uh, um, labor intense, more labor intensive per sheet than uh, simply going to the store and buying a, a ream of paper that's been pr uh, produced commercially. But it is a very interesting. And some questions come up about paper. When was paper first used? Paper was first used back in, uh, in China during the Eastern Han period. 
uh, from 25 to uh, 220 of the common era and um, that is a lot of paper mape from the period. So how, do, <clears throat> how long does paper last? Well that's a really good question. That depends and here's the technical way of explaining the answer. The rate and severity of deterioration results from internal and external factors, mostly, most importantly, the composition of the paper and the conditions under which the paper is stored. Okay, you can boil this down to two things. It lasts depending on what it's made of and how it's cared for. So if, and if you're not sure what it's made of, uh, you probably need to err in, in uh, very err strongly in the area of preservation and trying to preserve it rather than assuming that it'll just last forever. Um, paper can be made of rags and chopped up rags. And this, by the way, was the major way to make paper uh, for uh, most of that time period when paper was being created and most recently it is made more uh, more frequently and uh, rag paper is still available uh, at a premium and wood paper is really what we see all around us when we're working with paper. The difference here is the difference between long fibers and short fibers. Um, if you look at a, if you've ever had a chance to look at a cotton plant, and especially after the cotton bowl is opened and the cotton fibers are visible, that's the white, big puffy thing that comes out of the cotton, the cotton plant. Then you'll see what a long fiber is. Those fibers are uh, many inches long, and they are uh, each fiber is uh, substantial. But when you do paper, you chop them up into smaller pieces. Now, from the from the rag standpoint, those pieces are longer than the ones when you do wood fiber. And the wood fiber uh, paper, uh, the fibers are very very short compared to uh, the rag fiber. But the 1800s, most of the paper was made from rags. So any time up till around the 1800s, paper was a rag product. After the mid-1800s, most paper was made from wood chips and was a very acidic. What that means is that there, the process, there's chemicals in the wood that when the fibers are broken down and it's chopped into a pulp, uh, releases chemicals that are acidic in the sense of an acid, which basically eats away on the solid structure of the um, of the wood. So mm, you can see this kind of in nature if you want to just look out the window into a forest or or if you can want to take a stroll through a, a woodland or whatever and you'll see when trees have fallen down that they begin to disintegrate that the wood changes color and it and it uh, sort of uh, becomes decomposed. Well, that's the same process that is created with paper. It doesn't stop when you make the paper. So with moisture, the chemicals used to make the paper create sulfuric acid, which is destroys the and ultimately destroys the paper. And if you start listening to to what's happening here, you see the word moisture, and you begin to realize that that is probably one of the most destructive things that can happen to paper just simply being in a moist atmosphere uh, not just not discounting the fact of mold or other things that I'll talk about but the fact that the paper itself will just simply disintegrate so, so after about 1980 so you have about a hundred years in there or more when paper was made with a very high acidic com, uh, content and uh, only about a 1980, the paper mills begin to neutralize the acid in paper. So if you're looking at your historic documents that you received from your ancestor, uh, some kind of a document, just have to understand that if it happened and was created before 1980, it probably is on an acidic paper that will ultimately self-destruct. Paper, when it starts to self-destruct, looks a little bit like this. And uh, the 
fibers shorten with age and the paper becomes more brittle, it'll break. And uh, the classic here was a, a, a paperback book that I enjoyed reading when I was a teenager. Uh, it was a science fiction book and, and I uh, had it on my shelf and been carting it around for years and years. And finally, I thought, oh, man, let me just, I'm going to go back and read that book because I enjoyed reading that story, and I don't remember all the details. So I pulled the book off the shelf, and this paperback book that had been created uh, probably in the early 19, in late 1950s or early 1960s, simply disintegrated into pieces. It just fell apart. There was nothing left. And it had been fine as long as it had been sitting on the shelf because it hadn't moved. But once I moved it, that was the end of the book. It just disintegrated right there in my hands. So that was kind of my uh, a dramatic, not introduction, but a dramatic illustration to me of, of the, how the paper art. So what are the, what are the, the things that are enemies to paper and uh, will make the paper disappear and fall apart? Uh, first of all, sunshine, barely sunshine. Uh, for years and years, we lived in uh, the low desert down in, in Mesa and in Phoenix area uh, Arizo in Arizona. And interesting about that is, of course, we, as everyone else who lived uh, around in the area, were delivered a uh, like what you call kind of a throwaway neighborhood advertising paper uh, about once a week. This paper would get thrown into our, uh, our uh, driveway. And uh, it was a folded up newspaper kind of affair. Well, the interesting thing about this is that it just took the sunshine. If that was delivered to our uh, driveway in the early morning and we didn't get a, go out and pick it up by, say, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, that side that was up to the sun was already yellowed and the paper was already disintegrating just from the sunshine on the paper. That was not with any, of course, it wasn't moisture out there at all. It was extremely dry and it was just the sunshine that was uh, causing the paper to have a, uh, a chemical reaction and and turn yellow and then just and most of us are, are uh, familiar with the uh, with newspaper and how the newspapers turn yellow and old and all that has to do with the acid in the paper and uh, in many cases sunshine. And pollutants, all the pollutants out there in the world are all uh, the kind of uh, antagonize the uh, existence of paper. Um, so when you live in a high pollution area like we do here in Utah Valley, uh, during the winter particularly, we uh, were mindful of the fact that the, these pollution elements are also destructive of our, uh, of our paper. And lest we forget, there's also vermin out there. And that vermin can be a sort of, I don't think I will characterize this rat as cuddly or cute. Uh, however, this rat is uh, a major uh, uh, destructor of, of paper if they can get to it. And uh, we can also throw in a lot of bugs. There's lots, all sorts of bugs. You've heard of bookworms and they're real worms. They really are. They get in the run, in the books, and they eat their way through the pages. Uh, and uh, there's all sorts of other kinds of things. Uh, crickets uh, are notorious. Uh, uh, there's just uh, a long list of different animals that you need to keep away from your paper. Now, what happens when these uh, various uh, things, where paper not only has the chemical reaction, but has uh, water damage and everything is a really good example of a piece of paper that was still readable and uh, digitized uh, that we digitized in uh, Maryland and uh, those holes are not natural uh, they came about as the results of the little creatures and the uh, dark colored splotches are not natural they came about as a result of water damage and the rest of it uh, came about as as a result of the uh, the just the chemical changes in composition of the pa of the of the paper because it was wet. Now, if you look over on the left hand side of the screen, where the uh, discoloration narrows, you'll see paper that looks practically brand new. 
And that's because it was protected by being in a pile of paper or whatever from the, the uh, uh, elements that came in and, and to help to destroy the paper. So I would call water, mold, and, amage, and animal damage as the triple threat. Uh, in my years of, of trying to uh, resurrect some of these old documents, uh, I, would, uh, I really get upset when the water ha has stuck everything together and when there's mold on it, it just makes it almost, it, it's not very pleasant to sit there and work with a bunch of moldy paper documents. Try to clean them up. Of course, didn't mention yet, fire, which is the ultimate destroyer. Uh, if you burn the paper, it's gone. There's no preservation, there's no restoration, uh, and the only possible way that they're going to get preserved is if the uh, documents are actually uh, removed from the fires or copied. The worst case, of course, is uh, if a fire burns documents, like happened with the United States Federal Census for 1890. Uh, there was a fire, and uh, the fire burned a, a portion of the 1890 census. But a lot of what happened and what destroyed the paper was water damage from trying to put the fire out. Uh, and uh, ultimately what was left of the paper was not preserved and was thrown away through uh, failure of the government to allocate sufficient resources to keep the, the documents preserved. So when you hear about the fire destroying the 1890 census, I kind of recommend that you read a little bit of history about that, but you'll find out that it wasn't necessarily the fire that did all the damage. However, in the uh, St. Louis <clears throat> Military Records Repository fire that occurred. It was the fire, and then it was the water damage that occurred subsequent to trying to put the fire out. Okay, so here we go. This is a, um, a quote from the article on the Library of Congress uh, about the deterioration and preservation of paper. And it uh, summarizes the problems that we face in trying to preserve paper. So here it is. In the presence of moisture, acids from the environment, from air pollution, poor quality enclosures, or from within the paper, from raw materials, manufacturing process, deterioration products, repeatedly cut the glucose chains, which are the fibers, into shorter lengths. This acid hydrolysis reaction produces more acids feeding further and continuing the degradation. So you're kind of in a, in, a, in a range of trying to establish what is the optimal way to preserve the paper and not uh, put it in a situation where it's automatically going to get continued to self-destruct. And the fact is that too low a humidity can cause the paper to become brittle because the lack of any kind of moisture in the, in the fibers of the paper makes it very brittle. You know, think of uh, the difference between a piece of bread with moisture in it and a, and a cracker. If you uh, bend the, the uh, piece of bread, well, it might break, but uh, you can bend the bread pretty much before it breaks try a cracker, it will usually crack. What's the difference is the amount of moisture. is almost the same, in many cases, the same exact um, recipe for each of them, but uh, the difference is the lack of moisture creates the brittleness. In this case, this piece of paper, uh, once again, has uh, a lot of different problems. One is the holes in the paper, and the other are all of the mold and discoloration that came from having too much water. So for here's of, of some of the things that can happen. You can see on the, the left side there, uh, there's a lot of mold that was caused primarily by water seeping in and, uh, and allowing the mold to grow. The middle one paper has some water damage, but it's primarily uh, moisture content that uh, may not have been enough to get the, the paper wet, but it was enough to allow the, the, the paper to, uh, this, the acid in the paper to discolor the paper and also uh, 
tend to get it almost ready to be destroyed. And the third example over there on the right hand side is a piece of paper that got chewed to pieces by uh, probably mice or rats and uh, that's something that I believe could have been uh, more easily corrected perhaps than than trying to correct the humidity of the, the paper. Start with <clears throat> we start with good quality paper with no acid so we want to look for paper that is acid free and does not have any particular acid quality. Today you can buy that. Uh, there are uh, advertisements uh, that are kind of uh, generally put out about paper that all the paper is acid free well the answer to that is yeah some of it has less acid than others but acid free is uh, is basically a situation where the manufacturers have added in other what we would call buffers or uh, base chemicals that counteract the acid, but uh, give the paper wet and it'll disintegrate. Buy from quality manufacturers if you're going to uh, use the paper. Now here's the problem of course, we don't necessarily determine the paper that these documents that we have inherited or found or researched are, um, are made of. It's not necessarily what we uh, created ourselves and so we are uh, not in control, but we can control the environment of the storage of that document after it's been acquired. And another thing is we have a tendency to print a lot of things, scan and print and print and write and print. And the documents that we create off of uh, copy machines are generally, uh, if you have a home copy machine, it's generally a uh, low quality or lower quality printer that fuses the toner at a very low temperature. And the, and if you leave these two, f two uh, photocopied pages together for any period of time, and particularly if they touch anything with vinyl, like a vinyl notebook or whatever, then, then you'll, you'll be, remember the situation where you open that up and it goes click and you're, all of the toner is stuck to the vinyl or is stuck to another piece of, of uh, paper. That is, done, that is caused by uh, having a too low of a temperature in the fuser. The higher temperature fusers are not that much more expensive, but you really need to be aware that some, there are some printers today that you can simply set the fusing temperature. If you set it way too high, you know, it might make the paper too brittle and whatever. So you need to go in that and learn uh, whatever it is your particular um, printer is going. So I would emphasize here that acid-free in the, in the commercial world of selling paper does not necessarily mean acid-free. doesn't mean it doesn't have any acid in it. It just means that they may have tried to ameliorate the issues of, of having the acid by adding additional substances to the paper. It's kind of like having acid reflux or taking, you know, getting a, a little bit of heartburn from eating and then taking a whole bunch of uh, antacid down and just try to kill it off. Well, that's what they're doing with the paper. They're, uh, in a sense, adding the antacid with, to, to uh, diminish the effects of the, of the acid in the paper. First of all, it's really complicated, this whole situation of whether or not it's really acid-free. And paper made before the 1880s is not likely to be acid-free unless it was made from rags. So you can get cotton-based papers. <coughs> But you really need to um, uh, be careful with them. One thing you can say is that most paper today is acid free, but there's a lot of difference in the quality of the paper and the amount of care that's taken in the manufacturer and the number of chemicals and things like that that are added. So here we can see that uh, a normal piece of paper that you would go out and buy uh, at your local whatever. Uh, is uh, can run about five dollars, six dollars a ream right now is about the average price if you bought one 500 page package of paper or a ream. And then 
if you were to go to archival quality paper, it could cost uh, about uh, three or over three times as much, or $28 a ream. So these are prices that I looked up as to what the price would be for a piece of paper, you know, for a ream of paper in, of different quality. Uh, so that's one of the other important things that you need to bear in mind. Now, what kinds of things do we need to do to conserve the paper? The, what are our conservation method, measures? We want them storage at a, at a particularly low humidity. No, not a no humidity level, not zero, but 30 to 40 percent, which is a low humidity. Um, if you lived in Mesa, Arizona, 30 to 40 percent would seem high humidity, but uh, see, so it really depends on a lot of cases where you live and how, um, how much ambient humidity there is in your area. You can easily find that out by going and looking on any weather station, weather account, but for particularly in your home, uh, you may want to uh, get a uh, something that detects the amount of humidity in the atmosphere and lets you know what it is but you can you can know for sure that it's probably higher than it is outside your home uh, out in the unless it's raining or you ever standing in a flood or something obviously that's going to have very pretty high humidity protect the the paper from light um, that's very basic storage um, these are called, what these boxes are called clamshell boxes. They are archive quality boxes used for storing documents and keeping them in a position where they're not getting pressure from being laid flat. Uh, documents need to be stored as vertically as possible. And uh, this is the kind of a, not I would call it extreme, but it's the archive method of most common archive method of, of storing the documents. What I would suggest this is these are a little bit bulky, uh, not too home user friendly. Uh, the shelves you have in your home are probably not going to fit these boxes. So there's all sorts of considerations, plus they're quite, they're quite expensive. Per box is an expensive cost. One thing we do kind of emphasize is no metal, none of the pins or staples or fasteners. This is just a sample of some of the fasteners that we pulled out of the uh, documents in the Maryland State Archives. You can see that some of those pins, if you look closely, are handmade pins. And there's lots of other types of fasteners that we, in fact, we accumulated large jars, like large quart uh, gallon jars full of of fasteners while we were there pulling out the fasteners now why were they pulled out it was because the metal itself would corrode the paper and and discolor and destroy the paper so you took the metal out so that the paper would not be further damaged by having the metal in there okay now we've been discussing all of the pros and cons of the of the difference of of what's between paper and a little bit of talking about electronic. Now I haven't said much about how important it is to back up all of your information. Okay, so backing up information is really the, let's call that the generic term of, preserv of preserving your paper documents, but once again, even though it may seem uh, a, kind of an overkill, you need to do yes you need to keep your documents one of the most common uh, questions I get when I start talking about dig digitizing records and I just got a notice uh, within the last week of someone who said well I just finished digitizing my documents and it was sure comforting to throw all that stuff away well folks I don't know what we may have lost because he threw away those documents but he better be very careful to have preserved his electronic files and back those files up uh, in sufficient quantity to uh, to make sure that he isn't going to lose the information entirely simply because he wanted to uh, get rid of some paper uh, what other options do we have with paper that's sitting around well we may be able to 
donate some of the documents, uh, particularly original type documents, to uh, historical societies, archives, libraries. Um, however, I would uh, be careful that we understand that it's really our responsibility to preserve our own documents and that if the um, if if we try to go out and give them uh, to uh, archives and, and libraries and things I have found that oh, there usually has to be some kind of really interesting historical connection between the documents and uh, the library and the area where they're being preserved so you may not be able to find any interest for your collection of historical documents where you're living and yet someplace else may be um, may be appreciative of what you have so that sums up the idea of preserving our paper and preserving our our uh, and using of course electronics as a uh, another way of doing and preserving um, I hope you had uh, some there was questions I uh, would certainly uh, you can address those through uh, the YouTube channel by typing comments and asking the questions on the comments on the YouTube channel. All of these webinars are um, recorded and uploaded to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. And I uh, we would appreciate you if you would subscribe to the channel and uh, help us to uh, continue to provide this information. Uh, once again, this is a, uh, a rebroadcast of, in a sense of the of a, uh, presenta webinar presentation that was done some weeks ago before this. Uh, and uh, there were obviously some differences between the two presentations. Thank you again for watching and hope to see you next time. When we did the original recording, of this webinar. We had a number of questions after the recording was completed and we've de I decided to add back in those questions and the answers for your convenience period. Thanks James. I will now take questions so you, if you have any questions please post them in the chat box and James can answer them for us. Um, it looks like our first question comes from Kathy and it says could some of the stain slash darker areas on the documents um, be from oils on the hands of the person who handled it? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. I didn't mention that. Uh, common th uh, uh, ideas back in the, in the early days, uh, even until quite recently, was that uh, handling the documents would be difficult. Yes, that's true. The more the document is handled, the more possible that it's going to have uh, oil and, and dirt and things transferred to the document. Uh, you can see that by looking at books from the library that uh, have been used extensively or any of your own books that may have been used. Um, uh, if you have any little children in your home uh, and you have some books, you may have found that uh, mechanical destruction of the books is uh, is possible. They can uh, tear them into shreds. Uh, but the the theory of, of working with documents has changed. We did not wear gloves at the Maryland State Archives for handling the paper because they have discovered through a lot of uh, time of examination and a lot of start reports and studies that washing your hands frequently is less dis and has uh, it keeps the documents cleaner than using the old cotton gloves the white gloves you see on all these archivist old pictures because the cotton fibers are more destructive of the paper than your than whatever might come off of your hands so we were washing our hands three or four times a day, five times a day uh, on occasion. And uh, if we were handling the documents and that was, uh, that was the common standard today. So the answer is yes, you can. It's a good idea not to handle some things. Uh, one of the problems that I think see people hand, uh, handling all the time is to putting documents into uh, plastic sleeves, some of these sleeves. 
uh, some of those contain uh, chemicals which are more damaging to the paper than anything else that you can possibly do, especially uh, lots of different kinds of photographic albums are just, uh, you know, they, they kill off the documents faster than anything. So there's, uh, you have to be careful of what you add to the paper, but no, we don't wear gloves anymore. Awesome, great question. Also, um, Aline asked, what about storing in plastic? I know you already kind of covered that, James, but did you have anything else to say about it? Yeah, the, the type of plastic, there are some archival quality plastics. Um, uh, that, um, that, but the best, paper is the best storage. Uh, if you go to an archive and um, uh, get the opportunity to look at the archive documents that are pulled out, they don't put them in plastic because um, the plastic deteriorates at a, at a faster rate than the paper does. And so the, uh, the deterioration process of plastic can, can put out chemicals, uh, usually petroleum-based chemicals that are more damaging than uh, the, the normal weathering uh, process that happens with paper itself, the chemical changes to paper. So, uh, you know, I mean, people, if they're going to be handled a lot, um, then perhaps putting them in plastic is something that makes it more, uh, makes them more accessible. My answer to that is if it's going to be handled a lot, digitize it and put it on a screen. And then you don't have to worry about either plastic or the paper getting um, ruined by handling. Great. And Kathy also asks, can you copy the old information onto acid-free paper? Also, what types of documents would you want to store? Um, the type of documents that you want to store are documents that have historical value to, uh, to you and about your ancestors. Um, that is pretty, exclu uh, pretty inclusive we would like to include as much as possible. Uh, pen people are generally more liable to throw away uh, important documents than they are to keep them. That's just the nature of the way it works. So uh, keeping the documents, uh, letters, anything that has original, who was originally handled by the person. I guess at the other end of the spectrum would be totally um, documents that you have some kind of emotional attachment to. I mean, you get a car, card, uh, I, I think of a birthday card that says, love dad and has nothing else on it. Uh, you know, that may have a lot of emotional attachment, but it certainly doesn't have a whole lot of historical value. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that are you need to make a judgment on. As far as transferring the information, that's always a great idea. It's a very good idea to transcribe any historical document and have the transcription electronically stored uh, and it printed out on acid-free paper. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons for publishing um, surname books, uh, family history books, and keeping the information in that format. They're lively, likely to be preserved um, if it's in that kind of format, even if it's just in a library someplace. Great. Um, and the next question says, what about encapsulating a document? Isn't this a process that is used to preserve by some archivists? Well, uh, there's some opinions about that. Um, if you want to know the uh, the ultimate, uh, go to the, go look up the 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 uh, preservation methods used by the National Archives for preserving the original um, uh, copies of the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. What they've done is they've taken those documents and put them in glass containers that are filled with an inert gas so that they can't deteriorate and infer that there's no oxygen in the air to, uh, to let them deteriorate. 
uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you've destroyed the document if you take it and put it in one of those heat processes like laminating. Uh, you know, I think that laminating is the antithesis of preservation uh, because it 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 just it just destroys the document. There's no way to get it out of the lamination once it's been laminated without destroying it. So. Um, how long will the lamination last? I can tell you that a good piece of paper, like a, a good acid-free piece of paper, will last a lot longer than any kind of lamination process we have today. Anything else out there? Did I lose some, everybody? Um, no, we're still here. Oh, okay. So, Jay also asked, I'm not asking about laminating. Aren't some of the Book of Mormon fragments encapsulated? Oh, yeah. They're, they're encapsulated. They put them into um, uh, sealed containers, usually glass sealed containers with a, a glass with some kind of a, of a sealant around the end that is a non-reactive uh, non sealant. And then they have gas inside. Usually, uh, it can be nitrogen. Uh, it might be xenon. It might be there's lots of different gases. But they're what they would like to have is an, an inert gas, one that does not react chemically with with the paper. So that's how they preserve those. That's a very expensive process, by the way. Great. Thank you, James, for your for your answers, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. We'd like to remind everyone that on April 10th, Catherine Grant will be giving a webinar on Friday at 4 p.m. using Tree Sweeper to improve accuracy and family tree. So hope to see you there. And thanks once again for joining us and have a great day.